Hello, it's Chef Jeff from PracticalRenaissance.com, and today we're going to be playing around with the laser. Yes, that's right. We've gone back to the laser engraving machine. You may remember this from an older review video when we had some failures. But with a little adjustment and a few upgrades, we actually got this machine's frown upside down. So stick around, and you too can be the Charlie Sheen of your laser engraving machine. Okay guys, I wanted to revisit this machine. I did a review video on it almost a couple of years ago now. We had a few issues with it. There were uh, s some problems with the controller software, and some problems with repeatability and accuracy, and then there was just kind of a general issue of safety with it. And I've wanted to go back and revisit it for some time now. I finally feel like I had the proper opportunity to do so. So I wanted to share my journey of like how I kind of took the machine from like my experiences with it out of the box and then how I got it running pretty well. I mean, as you can see here, it's actually doing what we want it to do. And then we can from here further test its limits and capabilities to what it's actually designed to do. The first thing I had to do to get this machine running right was ditch the factory software that came with it and go with something like, well this, this is T2 Laser. This is something you guys recommended to me in the original review video. I'm not affiliated with them in any way. I downloaded the trial just to make sure that it worked with my machine, the setup, as well as the computer running it. And, uh, you know, honestly, I ultimately paid for it. It's 40 bucks. I put that in. You can do a number of things with the trial, but to get full functionality, you pay for it. And you know, if you really enjoy using the, mach the machine, it's, it's worth it, I think, uh, because it allows you full functionality. It's kind of like a CAD and a CAM and a G-code sender all in one. This program not only allowed me to really dial in as far as, like, power and feed settings with the machine, which is like a whole new thing with a laser. I'm only starting to get that with, like, metal cutting machines, my milling machine and stuff. With a laser, it's a whole different playing field. And I can also get a feel for different kinds of, like, cutting strategies, like like this, which is a trace pattern, which I kind of prefer for a lot of things, but then there's the scan line style for rasterized images when you want to do more of, like, a dot matrix setup. So the next thing I wanted to address was, well, how a laser cuts, and that's with heat, which means that you're generating an ember, you're generating soot, and you're generating smoke and fumes. Uh, all of those are pretty bad. So... The first thing I wanted to do was to make a little air blast setup. I had a spare piece of lock line. That's this nozzle looking guy. And you see him on like machines like lathes and mills. Uh, and I figured it would work here. So I made a little cylinder with some threaded inputs to adapt it to just a push to connect quarter inch hose fitting. Now the way I did this is probably way too complicated, so don't get intimidated by the fact that I'm using like metalworking machines and making something from scratch. There's probably a number of ways to do this. I, I know that I've seen uh, designs where people have used computer fans or, you know, just the hose itself. This does not need to be complicated. I just, I really want to reiterate that. It's one of those like, I had a lathe so I used a lathe, but you do not need... <laughs> to do this just to basically throw some very low pressure air right at the cut point of the laser beam. In conjunction with the air blast, the other thing that I wanted to do was move the whole machine to a spot where it actually get the smoke and the fumes out of where I was working, which conveniently happened to be in this new setup I just made in the last video, if you follow my channel, this paint booth. It's nothing super fancy other than a blower with a furnace filter on it, but that will actually take everything and suck it and throw it outside. This regulator manifold is, is literally just like a pile of fittings I had laying around the shop. It's a regulator and just a couple of random parts to give me like an on-off valve and a hose connector for both the compressor and then the hose leading to the cutter head. 
Again, this isn't super necessary. This is like 10 PSI, so anything you can do to get just a little bit of air movement right where the beam is hitting your workpiece is probably going to help. The other thing I liked about this hose was, was that it allowed me to do some cable management with all these motor cables. That was another issue I had with the machine, is that you've got these stepper motor cables just hanging around in the middle of everywhere wanting to get into the cut, and they don't. there's not a really good solution for getting them out of the way. Well, the rigidity of this air hose props them up a little bit, and I can use this tube to keep them generally out of the cut surface. I modeled up and 3D printed a little bracket to hold the whole air blast setup in place. It upgrades the zip tie that was holding it on there, but I still ended up using a zip tie to hold it on, so eh, whatever. It, I guess, looks a little nicer. And whether it came out on film well enough or not, it actually really did reduce the amount of smoke at the cut and the general odor of, you know, that burny smell this laser makes in the shop. So that was kind of nice, it felt like it at least worked a little bit, although I always wonder if that air blast isn't just going to aspirate any sparks or fires generated by the laser. We'll see! Now I'm assigning no particular order of importance to the safety train when I'm talking about these. These are all pretty much equal, but... So I originally had these green laser glasses that came with the machine. I lost them, couldn't find them, which is a blessing in disguise because after doing some research, it turns out that the ratings are uh, at best skewed and inaccurate. They might work, but I mean, when you're talking about betting your eyes on what could be instantaneous blindness, it gets a little scary. So I did actually end up kind of, I spent the money. I got some well-rated, uh, these are recommended by people who really do mess with lasers. Uh, these safety goggles. I got these, and they're they're rated for the specific wavelength of the laser. And, I mean, I found them on eBay actually used for half this price. But it's your eyes. I mean, like, if you're going to mess with it, you know, I, I don't want to preach. But here's the thing. You can see how bright the laser is just to, to the, the film sensor here. But then when I put the glasses over it, you get a really good sense of how much of that light... And this isn't, this isn't even, like, the dangerous stuff. This is just, like, the reflected, you know, what you can see while watching it. it I, I don't know. All to say it helps. Get good glasses, protect your eyeballs. Okay, so we solved safety, and if you're still with me, we're going to go into repeatability here. And I wanted to find the backlash of the machine, if it was mechanical or if it was all in the controller software. And turns out there was some mechanical backlash here. I had to adjust the belts of the x-axis, that's the left and right movement, uh, because it was just it wasn't being repeatable. You're seeing it come back and forth to the same spots here, and that's because even though I had zeroed out my indicator, it was going beyond its range. The y-axis, the front to back movement, however, was nice and repeatable. It was actually really surprising and impressive how accurate that seemed to be. The other thing I wanted to check was the output voltage of the stepper controllers on the Arduino board. Apparently this is variable, and sometimes it comes wrong. And it did on the x-axis here. It's only supposed to be 0.3 volts, and it was 0.5. I don't know how big of a deal this actually was. I do know that stepper motors can get really finicky about the kind of... basically all the electricity they're being sent, so I adjusted it down to a little bit closer to 0.3, or 300 millivolts. If this, if this was a contributing factor, that's great. If not, you know, I don't know. But we measured all of them and made sure they were as close as they should be regardless. And it seemed to help. I was getting a lot more accurate cut paths and didn't have any kind of, like, missed lines or end points and start points that weren't lining up, anything like that. And I also just kind of want to mention, again, about T2 Laser's pretty cool. Um, I don't think it's, like, perfect or anything. Obviously... Controlling a machine like this is a lot of work, and it's it's a pretty lightweight program, but it's really cool to be able to actually dive in and, and kind of choose cut paths to import an image and actually be able to just go around it in more of like a traced pattern. Uh, this, to me, kind of reminds me more like a 2D contour, you know, with traditional CNC machining. And, and that kind of allows me to wrap my head around how to, like, tell the program what to do so I can actually get it to, do, like cut out a rectangle. Or if I've got, you know, something that I want to try and 
get some depth, get some texture on like this, where it actually does the scan lines like a rasterization. It's kind of neat. I actually could not get the machine to cut this specific image the last time I tried. And yeah, it's a little bit of a novelty, but I love the fact that I can actually run a cutout routine and <laughs> basically cut out a little pre-made little label or something. This could be fun for a lot of these kind of soft textile, you know, softer materials that could be good for packaging, decoration, signage, things of that nature. It's a lot of fun, and I did want to go back and play with a few more materials for you guys. I was using cardboard because I have a lot of that and have some ideas for playing with that in the future. This is some eighth inch thin plywood, and I ran this pass a number of times to see if I could actually get it to cut, like 25 times. I got about a millimeter deep into it, uh, but j did not get even close to cutting it. Maybe you could if you just ran it all day long. There are some fun things you can do with wood, though. It will engrave, like I said, pretty deep into wood. This got about, oh... A few thousandths into the wood, but if you ran this path a few times a lot slower, you could probably effectively engrave it and get a pretty neat pattern. And this is, oh, it's 3D. So it's really fun to kind of figure out what you can do and, you know, different materials uh, for me because I tend to work with more durable stuff like metal, but there's still tons of stuff that you can do to support that with a machine like this. And it's a lot of fun just to play with and really figure out its capabilities, uh, even though they are limited. Anyway, thank you for watching. I just wanted to revisit this machine, like I said earlier, and show that uh, I at least wanted to try to make it work. Yeah, it's not perfect, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we got it to actually do some stuff, and that's pretty cool, and I'd like to kind of play with it in the future, really kind of push what it's capable of. Anyway, I'll see you next time.